see. Oh, recording has started. All right, I got a quick okay. question for you, and then, then we'll launch into what you're doing. Have you ever heard or played of a game called Russian Civil War by Decision Games? It's like a late 70s game. No, not really. Okay. Not really. Okay, that's fine. All right, we'll uh, we'll revisit this subject later. But go on, what you got, boss? Well, I, I kind of thought you were you were the one asking questions, but okay, oh, let's let's okay. let's see. No, I do got a I do got a question for you then. Okay. All right. So on my way down, way up here actually, because I just I drove from San Diego to Los Angeles this morning, so I was thinking about this on the way up. So I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but the crux of this whole World War II Yugoslavian thing from the locals' perspective is probably an epic clash between Tito and Mikhailovich, right? Hey, actually, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna now um, pull up a a picture of three guys, and okay. uh, we're gonna discuss this probably at length because oh, I think there's a okay. there's a guy missing there who is actually might be the most important one. Oh. More important than either one. Yay! Can you see all all three? Oh, hold on. Let me. No, oh, I can't puff that up, can I? Ah, it's pretty small here, but I recognize two of them. Is that that third person? Isn't who I thought it was, though. Is that the Croat guy? Is that a? Uh, yeah, he is. Uh, dang, I'm drawing a blank. Not, not the big guy, but the guy. Damn it! What's his name? I'm drawing a blank, Andrea. <laughs> Well, listen, his name is Ante. His last oh. name is Pavelic. Oh, so what is the guy? So wasn't there somebody that was like, had a little bit more authority, but he refused to kind of take the position of like the leader of the Croatian state and they kind of went with Pavlovic instead? Am well, I misunderstanding actually, that? Okay, so, so uh, there was a uh, democratically elected crowd politician, or democratically elected, not exactly elected, but the politician with the obvious uh, uh, popular support in, among the crowds. Right. Right. What was his, his name? Interwar period, his name, his last name is Maček. Maček, okay. And, but he, re uh, he refused the offer to form the government, right? I mean, with the, I don't there think is just he, a... I don't think he actually got the offer. Oh, uh, when the Germans so came this, in, yeah. So this when is post-invasion, post-German invasion, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. So actually, uh, when the Germans and the Italians invaded, uh, the Italians uh, brought with them this third guy, the guy on the right. Oh, and, he was from Italy. Uh, well, okay. I mean, he, he was a Croat from Croatia, but he was right. in Italy because he was in hiding there. Well, they also uh, had like training camps at one point there, but I think they were out there welcome and they had to go underground, if I remember rightly. <laughs> yes, yes, he had to go underground because, you know, his organization was highly illegal, uh, yeah. as, was, as was the Communist Party also from the other side. Uh, his organization is called Ustashe. And Stasha. it's and it's the 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 right wing, you know, extreme as opposed to the um, left wing extreme, obviously. And right. uh, he was he was in hiding in Italy uh, with a friendly government. Uh. Um, but you know, things things changed a bit when the invasion of, of Yugoslavia happened because um, obviously at that time it was clear that the Germans were boss, not the Italians. Right. And as as for the the that Croat politician, you know the you know normal or you know nationalist or democratic politician, uh, he basically supported the new government. Okay, so I have a question for you on this point. Then, so would you say in general that Pavlovich was more in favor of Italians over Germans, or did he really not? have a stand on that issue because it seemed like an issue that would have been more pro-Italian, but I don't think the Italians really did themselves any favors. I'm, I might be wrong though. Uh, well, uh, okay, let's go back to the Italians because oh, I, obviously this subject interests you, but and I completely understand that this, the, the Italians are, you know, they were there, they 
occupied like a third of Yugoslavia and it's everything is about yeah. Germans and, and Tito. So, yeah. you know, you know, obviously Italians did a lot there in. Um, OK, so 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 let's get back uh, to to World War One. So um, the right, Italians right. basically came into the Entente side uh, because they right. were promised a bribe of of, of Austro-Hungarian Dalmatia provinces. Oh, the they Dalmatian were, provinces. Wow. Exactly. OK, so that's it, so that's uh, outside of Venice, right? Because Venice is in Dalmatia or not in Dalmatia? Well, OK, uh, the, the Venice is like uh, on on a mid level, you know, a midpoint between, you know, the current Italian and, and Dalmatian, but it's more on the Italian side. But the oh, point okay. being is that the Dalmatia was a old Venice, Venetian province. Right. So Dalmatia had a lot of Italian citizens, you know, Italian people back then. Oh, OK. And the Italians wanted to get Dalmatia from Austria-Hungary. Yep. When Yugoslavia was formed, Yugoslavia got Dalmatia mostly. Hmm. And okay. Italians were not very happy about it. No, I wouldn't think so. <laughs> yeah, actually, actually, you know, I'm I'm going with a massive understatement there. Yeah, I bet. Okay. So you know, it's 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 you know a what if question, but you know, it, it one wonders if if you know Mussolini would actually come into power in Italy if Italy got Dalmatia, you know, if it got mm. its war aims and all those Italians did not die in vain. Because right. a lot of Italians died in World War One on, yeah, on the yeah. Sonso front and, you know, it uh, all for nothing, basically. Pretty much all for like a couple hundred yards or something crazy like that. It wasn't much. Well, they got a chunk. Uh, uh, they got Istria. Oh, so they, they did. Yeah, they okay. got something. But it's, you know, it's not commensurate, you know, obviously. Right. So Trieste is in Yugoslavia now or in no, Croatia no, 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 no. now or is it in Italy? No. Trieste is still in Italy. Okay. But the rest of but the rest of Istria is in Croatia. No. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. Yeah. So uh, so here we have a situation where Italians don't really don't like Yugoslavia. And mm -hmm. uh, they have a a you know. At some point, Mussolini takes over and they have a far right government there. Uh, so they're very, you know, revanchist and, and they're very, you know, against Yugoslavia. Right. And uh, when a Serb Croat divide, you know, flares up in Yugoslavia uh, because, you know, it's it's basically uh, it's it's difficult even to describe what what happened was that one Croatian main Croatian politician Basically, how to how to describe it? Uh, annoyed one Serbian MP <laughs> so much that yep. the, that MP shot him. Oh, okay. Holy so, cow. okay. So the thing escalated basically. Um, and this was, what was post, post German huh? invasion. This is no, post no, 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 no. This is all mid. This is all mid war. In, mid this is war. All the inter Mid interim. Oh, sorry. The interim period between two wars. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. All right. Go ahead. So you know. So so you know. We have to have you know the the big introduction because obviously otherwise it wouldn't be understandable. So what happened right, was, yeah. uh, you know, for, at at the first moment the Croats were pro Yugoslavian because this meant that they would get Dalmatia and Italy would not get Dalmatia, because All the right. Serbian army would come in and protect Dalmatia you know, and not let the Italians come in. However, right. uh, Cross very quickly, uh, you know, decided that they don't really want to be in Yugoslavia or that right. they want to have Yugoslavia federalized or, or confederalized or whatever. And right, they, yeah. they systematically voted for a party uh, which was the main uh, Croat National Party, which was basically, you know, anti-Yugoslavian. And right. not not really willing to uh, to cooperate with Serbian politicians. So uh, essentially, in that in that kingdom of Yugoslavia or that democratic Yugoslavia, uh, what happened was that Serbs si simply said, "Okay, fine. If you don't want to, you know, play ball, we'll just play ball with uh, Slovenians and uh, Bosnian Muslims." Right. Yeah. Of course. So they made a, this big coalition. So it was a Serb party, Slovenian party, 
and Bosnian Muslim Party. And right. that was basically the ruling co coalition, like, I don't know, 90% of the time or something like that. Sure, in, any yeah. case, in any case, uh, what happened was that, um, you know, uh, simply that Croat Party was, you know, of course, dissatisfied. I think that yeah. they, they, they even made some uh, connections with the communists. And at this point, Ooh. communists were, um, uh, at this point, communists were for breakup of Yugoslavia. See, that's so, kind of funny because that kind of makes sense why Tito would default towards the communists initially because he was Croat, so his initial affiliations probably would have been towards the Communist Party anyways because the Serbian party didn't really offer him anything, nor did the Bosnian party. So you would probably lean up with the communists just to give you some sort of power structure to start with. Well, uh, but in these first elections, uh, the main opposition parties were the Croat Party and the Communist mm -hmm. Party. Okay. So the Croat Party got, you know, votes from Croats. Uh, and right. it got like a seventh of the vote or something like that. In Communist Party, like, uh, no, no, one seventh of the whole vote. So the, the Croat Party oh. was, I think, fourth in right. overall voting. Right. Uh, the 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 Communist Party was, I think, third in overall voting, oh. and it got something like a sixth of the votes. And okay. it got votes, votes. However, it got protest votes. So uh, <laughs> I, I very much doubt that you know there were a lot of you know um, pro communists because of pro communism. They got yeah. protest votes from Macedonia and from Montenegro. So with uh, which had their own reasons to be dissatisfied. Right, and it yeah. got some votes in some cities. So, you know, not hmm. a lot of their votes were actually, you know, uh, made up because of their uh, social policies. It a lot had to do with nationalism. So uh, these, were, these, okay. were the two, these were the two main opposition parties. And uh, because uh, the Communist Party, you know, decided for the Communist International, which basically made them terrorists, they were hmm. banned. <laughs> Funny how that works. Well, listen, you know, it, they decided upon it, so it's it's there. Also, at that yeah. point, uh, at that point, they also murdered a uh, former uh, interior minister. I think some time uh, after it, or something before they were formally banned. Um, yeah, it's, it's this is more... a funny thing that you. This is a funny thing that you brought up right there. So mm -hmm. we're actually having a taste of that here in the United States, we're starting to have some real bad political discourse. And I don't think the average American realizes in most countries, this discourse leads to violence where people actually get shot. So I haven't really seen that here yet. However, I expect we're going to start seeing it. And I don't know what people are going to think because they're not used to that at all. Whereas in Yugoslavia or the Middle East or whatever, it's kind of like, well, if you're not losing party, you're going to die. That's kind of just kind of how it works. You're going to die or get imprisoned or something's going to happen to you. Well, it, it, so, it, uh, it, it depends. It depends on the moment. OK, for instance, in, in Serbia, we had a normal democratic government and we also had a dictatorship, you know, at various points. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I don't want to get the channel banned be, on, on account of com commenting America. But, oh, uh, you know, sorry, yeah, true. I, I was just talking more about the, the political discourse that goes on. So as you get a little less kind of democratized, you wind up with a little more more violent political discourse is what usually happens. So when you kind well, of go away from your social norms, it tends to get a little rougher in general. Well, OK, so uh, basically for America, I mean, there is one thing. Uh, America is very, very, very young, so it does not yeah. have a lot of uh, you know experience and knowledge uh no, really. america had it very good you know so it's yeah, it it's did. you know it's untested when the things go bad but on the other hand you have to you know you had a couple of situations when you had you know shootings though i'm not sure that that it was as bad as here because you know no, no, not not quite it's not, not where not really. it's not like Obviously. that yeah no. But, uh, you know, it's 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 um, well, it's going to get real bad real soon here, you know, in our story of Yugoslavia. It was oh, not yeah, good absolutely. before this. OK, it was not good even before this, because 
uh, there were warning signs even before this because in World War One, for instance, what the Austrians and the Bulgarians did, you know, you know, we, we better skip, you know, going into graphic details. OK, so, uh, you know, there were a lot of bad things that yeah, they did. That's a, so that's a different conversation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So but it's it's an introductory conversation. So yes. basically, basically what happened is, OK, Yugoslavia got made uh, partially because probably Yugoslavs wanted it, partially probably because the, the uh, great powers wanted it. Sure. Uh, yeah. The alternative for, for Serbia would be that Austria-Hungary survives, which is not good, obviously. No, uh, uh, yeah, Austria-Hungary had did not have Serbia's interests in mind. That's for sure. Well, let's 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 put it like this. You know, uh, you know, they didn't behave very nice here. Okay. No. You know, when when people think of Austria, they think of you know Vienna and the Waltzes and and Mozart and whatever. <laughs> they they did some re really horrific stuff here, so yeah, they, so, yeah. Well, you know, they have but, a long history of just doing stuff, and then of course you're fighting the Russians and the Turks who are also doing stuff. So yeah, there was a lot of a lot of nonsense to be sprinkled about there between all those countries. Yeah, uh, so uh, to get our story back to Yugoslavia, uh, what happened was that um, after this, a uh, crowd politician was shot. Uh, but basically, what happened is, of course, the country got polarized even more. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so the Croats partially went into open revolt, and the open oh, revolt yeah. was, yeah, that was led by the guy on the right. I mean, it's not a you know open revolt, real revolt. It's like right. you know they they starting you know fighting against uh, Yugoslavia with weapons, but it's right. it's not a huge deal. You know, it's it's you know some guerrilla actions, whatever. And also on the other side of the party, uh, 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 there was the other politician, Maček, which took over. Maček, that's what yeah. I'm thinking of. Exactly, and yeah. he took over and he led. What happened was that at that point, the Yugoslav king uh, uh, decided that the democracy at this point was really not working that well, so he made a dictatorship. Mm. And the, the dictatorship lasted for a couple of years. Uh, I think it it like uh, for like two years or so, and then he uh, again made the constitution. And there was, you know, parties came into being again and started working again. Um, mm. But it was never, you know, that open uh, as before because, right. unfortunately, you know, it, it it Yugoslavia couldn't work in any option seemingly. Mm. So you know, other than a a total complete dictatorship, which you know fell fell apart, as you already know. Yeah, so, so when you guys were in the 50s and 60s, that was a dictatorship pretty much. Well, it was communism. So it was, that's a dictatorship in the 50s through 80s, right, as well? Through, not, through the 90s. Through the 90s, so, yeah, and that's when it okay. broke up. Okay, all well, right. Well, yeah. Obviously, you know, Yugoslavia changed a little bit in, in that period because it's like 40 yeah. years. You know, obviously things oh, change, yeah. 45 years, things change in 45 years, but it started out as a hardcore communist dictatorship you know right. we'll get to that anyways yeah. anyways uh, so the guy on the right called Ante Pavelic again uh led his ustashe and he uh, and they went to they the far right you know the only far right option at that point at 29 and right. 30 that was it yeah. uh you know germany was an option only from 33 uh, uh from from Italy, uh, he masterminded the murder of of uh, King Alexander of Yugoslavia. Yeah, that's what and, I thought. Yeah, and this was this was something that was very very nice for Italy and Germany, uh, sure. because because King Alexander and Yugoslavia and you know the Kingdom of Yugoslavia or the Serb dominated Yugoslavia was a French ally. Oh, you know, very, oh, they were a French ally. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, okay. Yeah, a very strong French ally. So the Fr France lo lost, you know, big time at that point. Uh, on the other hand, 
On the other hand, uh, for, for you know more related to the communists, um, in in the 1920s, a lot of uh, uh, Russians came into Yugoslavia, you know, escaping really? from Russia. Oh, uh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. Also, the and communists. They, do killed, they live in like Slovenia and in Croatia? I guess. No, Serbia. Most. Oh, they Serbia. moved to Serbia. Ah, oh, they moved to Serbia. Yeah. Oh, because, they were in Serbia. Of course, you know they, uh, they did many, a lot. They did a lot to to uh, you know um, how how should I call it? Uh, how should I say it? You know, uh, beautify Belgrade. You know, and, and yeah. Serbia generally. They they brought a lot of to, to Serbia because you know Russia was a big European country cultured, you know, and, and you know, so so they, they brought, you know, a, a lot, a lot of things with them. Hmm. And they were welcomed because Serbia, because uh, Serbia and Russia and Imperial Russia with all the allies. Oh, and, yeah, they're still allies uh, pretty much. So, yeah. Well, when when there is Russia involved, um, however, Soviet yeah. Union was not an ally of of Yugoslavia. And was not an ally of the Serbs, because ultimately Soviet Union was mm. for for breaking up of Yugoslavia. Well, mission accomplished, I guess. <laughs> well, in the meantime, supposedly they changed their mind, but ultimately, you know, it got broke up. Well, so, yeah, but that may have been more for from internal issues than external issues, but a different conversation. Different conversation. We don't want to get there. Uh, uh, we'll go ahead of ourselves. It's just that. Yeah, so, uh, so, for, so you know, uh, from the from that perspective, it should it should be known that uh, both Italy and Soviet Union were basically enemy countries. You know, the sure. major enemies of Yugoslavia at that point. Hmm. So. Uh, well, that's so true because Germany's not really involved at the moment. Germany really has nothing to do there at, at in late thirties, anyways. In late thirties, it changed. It changed. Yeah. Well, then you actually had Germans starting to move in there, didn't you? Germans were already there. Oh, they were um, already there. Okay. Old Yugoslavia had uh, a sizable German minority in the region right. of Banat. Let me just okay. open open up a new map, just so you could. You know, track it. Okay, <laughs> let me find the new yeah. map. I see that picture and realize a, a great name for a game about World War II Yugoslavia that involved everything might be the, the Three Kings, Rise of the Three Kings, because <laughs> they're basically <laughs> a internal fight between the three different versions of how Yugoslavia should go. And then, of course, you have a bunch of external influences that have some say in the matter as well. Ah, okay. Okay, so th this is the division uh, imposed by Axis powers after they uh, occupied Yugoslavia. So if right. you can see this part called Banat, which is uh, in the upper right corner of the map, uh, which yeah, is light, so light uh, gray. Light gray? Yeah, gray, okay. Okay, in this region, about a half of a million Germans lived. Wow, that's a lot. Exactly. So the, these were the colonists, oh. uh, you know, from Maria Theresia in Austria, Hungary, and and whatnot. Um, they were, you know, uh, actually economically they were a big uh, asset of Yugoslavia because you know sure, yeah. Germans are really hardworking and and you know they're, you know, um, how, how do you how do you say it? You know, really. They're, they're productive. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They're very, very productive people. So, you know, yeah. Germany was a major industrial power and they, it didn't, didn't have colonies, you know, so oh, yeah. they made it by themselves. So, you know, for that, that they deserve a huge respect. However, you know, obviously, because uh, by the late 1930s, uh, uh, Germany was, you know, going far right. Uh, yeah. It, also, the German people there made up their Kulturbund, which was a affiliated, basically, party to the to the party ruling Germany. Ah. Not, not a party, but more of a Kulturbund. That's a cultural uh, association, but it's basically oh, okay. a party. Okay, you know. Um, oh, so, so now you have another political party with a little bit of clout. They certainly have some economic clout. Yes, yes, they hmm. they they were a major economic asset. 
So um, uh, at that point uh, in the late uh, 1930s, because obviously King Alexander was dead, he was replaced by a rather weak regent. And, uh, yeah, and Germany, his son, right? And, uh, I'm sorry? Was it his son? No, no, it was his, it was his cousin, Prince Paul. Okay. So uh, basically his son was still a minor. So basically right. what happened is obviously Germany and Italy are ascendant. Uh, mm -hmm. So a, in Yugoslavia decided to go a little bit, a little bit more pro axis you know, because, uh, you know, they had all the power at, at that point. Right. And uh, uh, it did help economically, okay, because um, there, there was a, a prime minister which was, you know, very savvy, economically speaking, and he was relatively friendly towards Germany and Italy, okay? So he managed mm -hmm. to keep, you know, an equidistance between, you know, France and Britain and Germany and Italy. Oh, okay. Okay. Soviet Union was still off limits. It's a still an enemy country, and uh, mm. you know, communist. Uh, formally, formally, you can get capital offense for being a communist, or uh, sure. you know, engaging in communist propaganda. But informally, uh, the, the you know, the kingdom was not very strict in that regard. So right, basically, right, what right. happened was that uh, both communists and Ustasha were you know kept in prison, mostly. Ooh. They wow, they shot okay. they shot a couple of communists, but honestly, Stalin shot more communists from more Yugoslav communists than you know the the the, the Yugoslav police. And uh, okay, they were chasing Gustashe, uh, you know the Pavelic's organization, but obviously because they were also in prison, they didn't shoot them outright. So uh, right, you know That's obviously funny how that the, works. yeah, the, obviously the kingdom was. I mean, it's not exactly a democratic country, but it's obviously not a totalitarian dictator dictatorship like these two were wanting to. Uh, I don't know how you describe that, but yeah, it's something it's it's yeah, they're not communists, but they're also not a dictatorship. So it's just uh, it's kind of democracy. Uh, do you have guess of a parliament? Do they have a parliament at that time. It's it, oh, yeah, there, there is a parliament. Um, uh, well, okay. You can call it you can call it a authoritarian country. Or you can right. call it a, a semi-authoritarian, semi-democratic country, whatever. It's a, a simply, you know, it's how it is. It's not like uh, you can do anything you want exactly, obviously. But it's, it's not like, obviously, you have dictatorship which shoots people on the regular. So right, yeah. it's, it's, it's very much closer to Western, obviously, you know, since it's a French ally, it's Obviously, it would have a system that is much closer to France than you know anything else. Right. right so yeah, you know yeah. that's that stands for reason. So how um, did they become a French ally? Well, uh, basically because uh, uh, in World War One, uh, you know, Serbian allies were Russia, France, and Britain, and right. Italy. Uh, obviously, Ru Russian alliance, alliance meant the most because. You know, Russia provided the actual help in terms yeah, of political. Yeah. Uh, however, when Russia was basically destroyed in 1917, oh. France was was left as the major ally at that point. Yeah. Obviously, you have also Italy and Britain. However, Italy got annoyed by losing Dalmatia, so we <laughs> lost a major ally at that point because yeah, Italy. Too. Yeah, and also Britain was an ally. At least Serbs thought Britain was an ally, but that's that's a whole other story. You know, that's 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 being polit you know very politically naive. But we'll come to that. Anyways, yeah. <laughs> anyways, uh, all right. That that makes more sense. So France was like the last last one standing after World War One is pretty much the bottom line there. Well, the Turks were gone too. So yeah, I guess at least France. All right, go ahead. Okay, so. We basically come to the moment. Uh, however, at that point, uh, World War II starts, uh, and uh, Yugoslavia was neutral, obviously. And yeah. however, what happened was uh, France lost very quickly, and that was a yeah, huge yeah. shock for for uh, for Serbs, of course, mostly. Oh yeah. That you know, officers uh, probably 
uh, as I heard, officers uh, who wore a black armband in mourning. Oh. Um, so wow. Britain, yeah, Britain was only the only one left standing. And at that point, what happened was that Italy att attacked Greece from Albania. OK, so what happened was Italy took over Albania a little while ago and it attacked Greece in 1940. Right. However, it got bogged down. Yeah. And also Italy made some provocative actions towards Yugoslavia. It, it uh, you know, I think it bombed with artillery uh, Yugoslav city in, in the south. Really? Wow. And it seemingly it was a nice opportunity for Yugoslavia to to come into the war and attack Italy. However, uh, at that point, a lot of or not a lot, but a part of the Yugoslav general staff and some in the in the leading officer in the general staff was a pro-German. So he basically um, delayed the reaction and, yeah, I see. and the opportunity passed. OK, so we have huh. obviously so we have uh, Yugoslavia obviously is a very uh, how should you call it? heterogeneous country, very diverse country. Mm. Uh, a lot mm. of people had divided loyalties. Oh, yeah. So well, we're talking about the Serbs. Serbs prefer France. Serbs mm. prefer Britain. Serbs would prefer Russia and some Serbs prefers the Soviet Union, although it's not Russia, but you know, they can't tell the difference. Right. Okay, they're communists. Communists obviously prefer the Soviet Union. Yeah. And communists at, at the point of, of the Ribbentrop Molotov Pact are obviously not very against Germans. They're not against Germans at all. Well, so, not, not 1940. And, they didn't care about the Germans at the time. Yeah, well, they're, they actually, they're, there's, you know, reason to say that they were working for with the Germans. Yeah, well, they signed a peace treaty in what, 1939? They had an alliance yeah. in 39? Oh, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Oh, and also we have then the Germans, obviously. Uh, we have the Croats. We have the Albanians, probably a part of Slovenians, which are pro German. Right. Or pro Italian. So, uh, uh, yeah. Yugoslavia, obviously Yugoslavia was, and we have, of course, in Macedonia, a lot of the people were pro-Bulgarian. Oh, so, wow. So, okay. Yeah, so we have a, a you know, a, a lot of, you know, it's not a lot of homogeneity here. So it's, it's a completely different experience for the Serbs, uh, which, you know, uh, managed to beat up the Turks, the Austrians, <laughs> you know, even the Bulgarians, because they were united. Yeah, actually, they did a really good job pre-World War One and <laughs> beat the crap out of all of them. Yeah, so but that was a, 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 acting from a, a different perspective. It's a smaller, uh, much smaller country, but it's very united, very homogeneous. Yeah, yeah. So here we have a, a larger country, but it's made of disparate parts. And it, I mean, honestly, when we talk about Yugoslavia, you know, it, it's basically never passed a stress test. No. You know, it, it collapsed in 1941, it collapsed in 1991. Yeah. Supposedly, you know, supposedly Tito's partisans were like a efficient fighting force, but honestly, we're going to talk about them. It's, you know, as you can see from the division of the country, and you will now see the ethnic map of Yugoslavia. Ah. And uh, just just so you have an idea how it looks. Uh, this is, I think, a more modern map. Let me share it. Uh, let me share this map. OK. Please bear in Ooh. mind that this is more modern. Wow. What is this there? There are no Germans here. They have been ethnic, ethnically cleansed, and Italians were also well, ethnically yeah. cleansed. So this is a more modern, you know, after World War II. But oh, you right, know, okay. you you get the idea. Okay, so yeah. you know, all of this country, all of these colors have different loyalties. Oh, that's a pretty good map, actually. Wow. Yeah. So the blue blues are Serbians, the orange are Croats, and the greens are 
Bosnian, I guess? Yes. Yes. And, I don't know what the uh, purples are. Macedonians and Bulgarians, or uh, uh, the, the gray ones are Slovenians. The 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 um, the purple ones are Macedonians. Macedonia, Macedonia is okay. a yeah. Macedonia is a difficult subject. My grandmother was Macedonian. Yeah. Okay, she was uh, Macedonian. Her father was Bulgarian. Her mother was a Serbian, and her uncle oh was a Greek. Oh, jeez. Don't, don't even Family ask. Fights much? <laughs> okay, it, don't even ask how that happens because when she asked uh, her mother, why is your brother a Greek? The mother said, he's a Greek and don't ask that question ever again or I'll beat you up. So it's <laughs> it's pretty much like, you know, it's it's like that. So it's it's a complicated oh, subject. Boy. I don't want to touch it with a 10 foot pole. Yeah, pole. Okay, fine. so it's like Macedonia was not a big deal during the World War II, so we'll basically try to skip it as much as possible. Uh, I don't it had no relevance in World War II per se. Lots going on in World War One, but nothing in World War II really. In Macedonia? Yeah. Not a lot. Not a lot. Mm -hmm. Not a lot because a lot of the population decided they want to be Bulgarians. Uh, so that was so, a reasonable call at the time. That's not not completely out of touch there. Well, no. They uh, probably uh, regretted it in 46 and 47, though. A different conversation. No, not really. Not really. They just became Macedonians. Oh, they switched back. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You can switch. That's a good plan. Yeah, you, you can know. switch, yeah. So, <laughs> this is a really good map, though, I have to say. So, uh, it, there it's are not certain... Actually, yeah, it's not actually accurate at that point. It's yeah. This is a more modern map. But uh, you get the idea, okay? It's right. you know, obviously, it's it. This is how it looks. So what happens is, and we get to the three guys back. Mm -hmm. I'm going to, the I'm three going kings. To, yeah, I'm gonna get back to the three kings. Yeah, that's actually a great like, name for a game. I might I might go with that. Three kings. I like that. <laughs> Listen, it's, it's as far as I'm concerned, it's free, but hell in the Balkans is taken. Yeah. Anyways, that's actually um, a really tough call. Well, I mean, you probably argue Tito, but that's just because he's the one who won and he's the one that held sway for 50 plus years. But Tito couldn't have done Tito things without the other two guys, that's for sure. Well, uh, uh well. Just let let me qualify that. Uh, yep. Tito, Tito would be would be a lot in a lot better situation if Mihailovic did not exist. Uh, yeah. Because because we'll we'll be discussing who is who had the greater impact in terms of uh, well it's it's uh, let me rephrase this okay so when you look at the war obviously Tito won because he was you know standing in control of Yugoslavia. Yeah. So it's in that sense he he definitely won, but the question is who had the greatest impact, and whose ideas you know who ultimately can be called you know, a fifty years on, eighty years on as the ultimate victor, and who had the had the greatest impact on the war in Yugoslavia, hmm. and uh, we'll discuss this. But for me, it's definitely guy on the right. Really. Yes. Wow. Oh. Yeah, that's going to be a good position for you to try and defend. I'm, I'm not sure I agree with you there. <laughs> well, that's that's why we have this podcast. So what you've done, Andre, is you've given a perfect inroad to our next session to talk about these three guys. But I do yeah. want to go back to my Russian Civil War question there, then if you could fancy a moment diversion here. So I've actually been working on a game on World War II Yugoslavia, but I'm working it from like a four player perspective. So it doesn't really quite capture things so well. It almost like it needs to be a five player game or something. But one of the issues you have is, well, actually I'm gonna go back to Russian Civil War. So Russian Civil War was a game done by decision games and Normally, if you do a game like that, you would say, OK, well, these are the red guys. These are the white guys. And these are all the kind of ancillary guys. You could kind of go back and forth with them. You could kind of swap them out and do things with them, depending on how it goes. 
So what they did with their design is they just had, okay, you've got this force pool. It represents like strength points from the different sides. And you put all these strength points together in a big pile upside down so you don't know what they are. And you draw out whatever your allotment is. So, you know, if you're a lot 20, you get 20 chips or something. You flip them over and this is like your starting force. So your starting force is almost certainly going to be a combination of all these sides. And what you have to do is you kind of have to figure out with this force that you've picked, where do you kind of want to emphasize your your setup? I mean, do you have a lot of red guys? So I set up in Moscow. Do I have a lot of white guys? So I have to set up in the Crimea. Do I not really have much in anything? So I kind of have to pick a side where I put all my guys. And I thought, you know, that would actually be an interesting way to do a Yugoslavian thing because the thing about Yugoslavia is when you start, you have all these factions that are kind of fighting, but you don't really have like power alliances per se. Like, you know, you look at Tito, who was ostensibly a Croat. So you can make an argument that he should have lined up with the Astasha and the Croatian side. But yet, you know, he's way more politically savvy. So he realizes, well, I can make an alliance at all these other guys. I don't have to stick to just Croatian guys. Whereas Mikhailovic obviously leaned with the Serbians because that's kind of like what he knows. He knows how to create a Serbian power base. But when you do that, you kind of leave the Croats out. You leave all the other guys that aren't Serbians out because the Serbians are only like a certain percentage of Yugoslavian population as a whole. But it's like 40%, I guess. So you have a nice power structure, but it's not really enough to kind of control the whole country. So to me as a designer, that seems like that'd be a good way to approach it. Like, okay, you have like a random force pool now you kind of have to pick which way you want to try and mold this force pool into something that you can fight the Germans and take over the country at the end of the war. That makes sense. Well, <laughs> kind of went on a ramble there. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. Uh, I mean, uh, in terms of the, in terms of the, you know, uh, in terms of the of of their both limitations, Mihalovic is a Serb, um, Tito is a Croat and a communist. So, you know, that goes positive with some people, but goes negative with the others. So they're both oh, limited. Yeah. They're both very much limited in, in, you know, the support they can get. Because obviously, non-Serbs would not be probably ecstatic for Mihailovic. I guess, oh. you know, Slovenians would be fine, but Croats, for instance, would not. And also oh, for no, Tito, you know, also for Tito, non-communists would not be ecstatic for him. And also, you know, after after people find out more, you know, Tito becomes unpopular in Serbia and things like that. So uh, it's it's you know uh, you have all the all kinds of limitations on them. Uh, and uh, and on the other hand, the, what what really is a problem with Yugoslavia is that there are like twenty factions, twenty plus factions <laughs> here. Yeah. So uh, uh, my idea, honestly, you know, is a, a three player game. And I'm dedicated, you know, yeah. for that. And uh, the, the three players would be, you know, Mihailovic, Tito, and the Germans. And uh, everybody else would be up in, uh, up in air, you know. Uh, uh, it would be a question of who controls, you know, who would have more support and where. So, for instance, the Italians would be... Yeah. The Italians would be a fight between Germans and, and Mihailovic. Uh, Croats would be a fight between Germans and Tito, Serbs between so, uh, Mihailovic and Tito. So you know things like that. So the problem uh, with that, know, the problem with that perspective is that it kind of leads off the third of your three kings there because now you just kind of take the whole Croat issue and kind of make it just like a subunit of the game, whereas it's actually a pivotal part of what happened because the fact that the Croats are there doing stuff has an impact on what everyone else is doing because you can't really do things freely in Croatia. Or more to the point, the Germans could actually mobilize the Croatians to impact the other two factions because that's all the Croats could do is beat up on the Serbs and the communists. I mean, that's kind of what their role would wind up being with the Germans mobilizing them. They become another police force for the Germans inside of Yugoslavia. So you kind of take that off the table if you just make it a three-player game. I don't that's uh, a design well, choice. Huh? Well, in in terms, but in terms of the Ustasha regime, when when we talk about it, and we'll talk about it a little bit more, of course. But you know, oh, just yeah, of course. Just <laughs> two words, two words at this point. In terms of military military efficiency, they're not great. 
Okay. No, they're pretty and pretty bad actually. <laughs> in terms in terms of in terms of rounding up civilians and doing horrific stuff, oh they're like top of the line. But in terms <laughs> of military in, in military efficiency, they're not great and they mostly operate as German auxiliaries in any serious uh, right. situation. So right. and you know, Pavelic knows this very, very well. Well, and he wants German officers and uh, like 90,000 uh, uh, Croats went into German, German, uh, you know, formations like the SS, wow. so, the police and whatnot. So, so you never, you never played a. Oh, uh, the legionnaires. Legionnaire, hmm? You never played a coin game by GMT, have you? Not really. I, right. I, I must plead ignorance. No, oh, no, no, that's fine. Uh, eventually, I'll have to introduce you to what I'm doing at some point, but for the moment, don't worry about it. So in that game, they basically split up the military forces into two types of forces. You have like ground troops, which are basically combat troops. They go fight. And you have police forces, which they could fight a little bit, but their thing is more like population control and kind of make sure all your lines of control are open and you're basically like, you're the people know that you're in power because there's a policeman on my block you know so it's not like they really expected to fight they're more like a projection of the power projection of control so to go into this croatian astasha thing a bit here so if you had astasha as a separate faction they would probably wind up having a lot of police force but not much military force whereas the germans would probably have a lot of military force but not so much police force so you would actually as a German player, you would come in and you'd probably use these Ustasha as your police force because there's a ton of them. So it's like, okay, well, we'll put all you guys over here. That way I don't have to put my police there. My military thing will be here in case something spins up. I can just deploy my military there to crush whatever this thing is. But the Ustasha would be like on the street corners initially. So they'd be like the police force because they didn't yes. really have a military force, right? Yeah, they Not did. a big one. Yeah, they. I want, think they had a you know, division. They sent some troops to the Eastern Front, didn't they? They had a they had a military force which was probably greater, probably greater than the Chetniks and the Partisans combined. Really? Probably, probably. Oh, but it wasn't very good at military things. No, right? well, you, no, no, no. Okay, so what? Uh, the, Interesting. The, what they had? Okay, well, okay. <laughs> So, yeah. okay, so there's like two so, topics right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, we can go into the more detail because they had like three different aspects, which is the uh, which is the Domobrani or the Home Guards or the or their like regular army. They had right. Ustasha, which is the SS equivalent, Polit you know, political, yeah, political, political arm, political, commissar, yeah, yeah, arm. something like that. Yeah. Uh, Political arm, uh, which but they had Ustasha both regulars and militia, okay. Oh. And they had, okay. and they also gave people to the to the German formations. First of all, legionnaire divisions, three three of them. Oh, SS that's divisions. Three divisions. Oh. oh, five actually. It's five divisions. Wow. Well, okay. Uh, well, okay. Uh, three three legionnaires, one SS full strength and one SS um, under strength, you know, never right. reformed. But uh, right, this right. SS, SS division was more of a Bosniak Muslim um, personnel than oh. Croats per se. Yeah, that was that thing that the Mufti, Mufti of Jerusalem came in and was like kind of part of, I think, I forgot what they call it, but the, the Arab Andra. division, I guess, or the Muslim division. <laughs> Whoops, sorry. Well, got excited to drop my phone. <laughs> so it's it's called a hundred division. It's a type Hanja. of a knife knife or, or a, you know Bowie knife equivalent. Okay. So yeah, so uh, it's like the curvy blade, isn't it? Yeah, the, yeah. Sort of the curve on it. Okay. Yeah. So so th this is this is actually oof, I think it was twenty five thousand. You know, a over strength division. But uh, the point being is that uh, so the, the the point being is that mostly when Croats operated um, in any kind of a serious you know offensive against the the insurgents, there were German Germans present. You know, it's oh, yeah, usually of yeah. So but so, so the point is that that yeah, it, broadly speaking, 
I think you're correct because they are more of a police force as as compared to an actual, you know, actual fighting right. army because they didn't right. simply have the quality of the fighting army. Um, right. Something that is that is seemingly always, I don't know how it happens, but you know, um, let's not just overstate the quality of the troops that were involved here in World War II in Yugoslavia. Right. Okay, Perfect. so. Yeah, okay, there was one big time first line German division, and when it came in, it you know they it messed up the guerrillas really bad, uh, partially because you know of fighting, partially be on 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 account of a, a trick, but it's complicated. Mm. I'll explain it. Um, okay. So there was one real you know you know first first mountain division you know that. That was a tough division, full strength the German first line division. But right. other divisions were second line, uh, locally recruited, um, local SS, um, and 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 things like that. Uh, it's you know not a lot of those were were needed here for Yugoslavia because you're obviously fighting yeah. guerrillas. So, oh yeah. I mean, if you want to fully conquer Yugoslavia and keep it occupied, then you should use the whole German army. Okay, then the whole Wehrmacht needs to come in and occupy, you know, each specific space. But for for yeah, they, the thing that they, they, they needed, do that. you know, uh, no, it's not cost effective. So, but the yeah. other, so they went with the other, you know, they obviously used a relatively. Well, they tried to use an undersized force, but it didn't, didn't work. They had to they had to make buy. So uh, yeah. it's it's just you know in terms of the comparison. So uh, honestly, when we talk about, for instance, about the, the Croat Croatian Home Guard, they're really bad in terms of the quality. So I guess what you think about is that most of these guys that were here would have been second line troops on the Eastern Front at best. So they wouldn't have put these guys in the front line unless they absolutely had to. Yes. These would be your reserves. And every once in a while, a real unit would show up, but it would be really infrequent. So it's pretty much a battle between, uh, well, bench warmers, <laughs> to use American football term. Oh, battle between second stringers. Yeah, that's what it is. Your second string team is out there doing the fighting. <laughs> and and also, also for the guerrillas, a lot of the Serbs and the Serb officers were POVs in Germany. So Mikhailovich's oh. base was depleted because of that. He couldn't get enough officers. And for the communists, they had a problem oh. because they, they basically didn't have any officers. And uh, yeah, also because of, their, uh, because of their political, you know, because, you know, yeah. they were communists, they couldn't get a lot of people that were already, how should I say it, uh, property people or or you know well uh, they, they, they really had, had a political to, affiliation you couldn't really switch that easily yeah yeah they had to recruit young people mm, that's and, a good point yeah so so also you know uh okay obviously they recruited anybody they could get their hands on but uh, mm -hmm. you know these people desert so so we have uh, three topics now to talk about andre and this is pretty good so the first one would be your three kings. We should revisit that because that's actually kind of important to your point of view. We kind of scoped that out. The second one would be uh, how bad the Croat army was, although we kind of discussed that, but it might be good to have a more specific example. And another one might be these recruiting tendencies, you know, the difference between the fact that the Serbians actually had a bit of a military machine, but it was depleted because of losses from the invasion versus Tito actually had to stand up a military machine from scratch. And of course, when you do that, they're going to fight and you kind of want to like promote the guys that fight successfully because you're always going to have a bunch of losses and you're going to have a bunch of losses until you get more efficient. But you only get efficient by making the guys that can actually fight, kind of molding them into better leaders. So it's like a process. So, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, okay, we got plenty of topics then. Oh, yeah. 